Hello everyone, I'm Natalia Bilbao and here's what's happening in LA this week. This week, Mayor Eric Garcetti addressed Angelinos in his last State of the City speech. The address, held outdoors at the 6th Street Viaduct site, outlined how Mayor Garcetti has worked to make Los Angeles a better and stronger city from his first day in office. In 2013, I told the people of LA that I would work every day to accomplish two things. First, to get your city hall back to the basics by restoring and expanding those core city services that we depend on. And second, to build a city of the future with greater economic opportunity and stronger infrastructure across all of our neighborhoods. And I also knew we had to grow our city's resilience for any emergencies we might face. So the next day, day one, I went out to the valley and got back to the basics and paved a street. It was an opportunity to hear him reflect upon his time as mayor and his time as an elected official and to walk down memory lane a bit and remind all of us about just the strides, the advances, the improvements under his leadership, under the ideals of what this bright city on a hill can mean here in Los Angeles. I was glad that he reminded us of how much progress this city has made in the last decade because uh, for so many of us, especially over the last couple of years, these have been especially trying times. And very often, we as policymakers, as well as all of us as Angelinos, see the problems of the moment, and we sometimes lose sight of the longer-term perspective of how much progress this city has made over the last 10 or 15 years or so. It's been remarkable. To our thousand great purposes in L.A., we added a grave one these past 763 days. No one saw a pandemic on the horizon, but the city of LA was prepared to meet it when it came. Our battle with COVID was both our darkest and our finest moment. But today, as we assess the state of our city, this epic battle has left us tired and bruised, but we're also healing. This week, hospitalizations are at their lowest point since last July. COVID isn't over, but its grip is loosening. We have launched historic anti-poverty programs, made community college free, invested in our key industries and cut our business tax and our bureaucracy to be more business friendly. And as we do that work, we've boosted community college attendance from our public schools by 40%, creating opportunities for young people in our tech and entertainment industries. I'm from the Youth Development Department and our young people have uh, really suffered quite a bit of trauma this past couple of years with the pandemic and it's so great to have one foot out of COVID and bring young people back together so that they can re-engage both in education and in employment. What I've really worked hard to do which is to create a place of belonging. I know in America and in this world right now people don't always feel like they belong. Even with, with our challenges here, I think people feel like they belong in LA. This is our collective city, and I'm certainly gonna miss that. The U.S. Citizenship and Immigration Services Department, in collaboration with the Office of Council District 1 and various community organizations, recently hosted their 10th family reunification event. 18 senior citizens from several locations in Mexico were granted 10-year humanitarian visas to visit their loved ones here in Los Angeles, and the participants could not have been more grateful. El día de hoy se llevó a cabo un reencuentro familiar denominado Abrazos y Más Abrazos. Es un programa en el cual está basado para que todas aquellas familias que no han podido venir a ver a sus familiares durante más de 10 años, por fin puedan venir a, a visitarlos. Today we're reunifying nine families that are going to be reunited with their family that they haven't seen in over 20 years due to the distance, some living in Mexico and some living here. So every family that's here today, they all got a tour visa, so that allows them to actually enjoy their family that they haven't seen in over 20 years. Iniciamos desde el proceso de hacerle un perfil a cada persona, hacemos el trámite, les damos una capacitación constante 
para apersonar a cada una de, la, de las personas solicitantes al día de su entrevista consular y eso les da mucha, mucha fortaleza. Gracias a ellos se hizo posible nuestra presencia acá para visitar a nuestra hija. Yo tengo dos hijas aquí, si ellos se vinieron por la economía pues que estamos pasando allá, vinieron ellas para salir adelante un poquito. Una tengo 25 años que no la he visto, la otra tengo 20 años también que no, no la he visto. Yo estoy aquí, bueno, lo principal por ganas de ver a mi hija. Tengo, puedo estar 30 años sin verla, pero, pero la verdad es una gran emoción. De todos los que vienen acá, reciban un abrazo, como dice, como dice el programa, abrazos y más abrazos. Es algo maravilloso, después de tanto tiempo y aunque uno se mira en, en videos, en las redes sociales, no es lo mismo para darle un abrazo, para convivir con él, no es lo mismo. Así que es algo es muy emocio, emotivo. Es el mayor tesoro. Usted era mi papi, a mi mami aquí, muchas emociones. Es, es algo indescriptible la felicidad que nos están viendo. Tenemos 24 años que está con ellos y con ellos, es todo normal. <ríe> cual... El trámite es una visa y créemelo que me da mucho gusto decirlo, que es una visa de turismo, que a todas estas personas se las dieron por 10 años, por durante 10 años van a poderla tener y ver, ir y venir las veces que ellos deseen. ¿Qué es el consejo que yo les doy? Pues que tienen que cubrir todas las normativas americanas cabalmente, que cuiden mucho sus documentos americanos, porque una visa es una bendición hoy en día. From the steps of City Hall, a new resource was announced for the Black and Latino immigrant populations in Council District 9. The Coalition for Humane Immigrant Rights, the Central American Resource Center, and the Black Alliance for Just Immigration joined forces to unveil a much-needed $1.25 million immigration relief fund. So we are here to make a very special announcement. Council District 9 neighbors are going to have access to an unprecedented $1.25 million immigration relief fund. This is part of a Council District 9 initiative. It's going to allow Council District 9 neighbors to have access to filing fees that are going to come out of this fund to pay for everything from naturalization to green cards to DACA, TPS, and it also includes a mini version of a justice fund so that our neighbors who are undocumented and may be facing deportation have access to legal representation. For the first time in the history of the city of Los Angeles, we believe at least, we have an investment that's being made by a city council person into supporting the lives and the dreams of migrants through the provision of services, outreach, and education. So for our communities, it means a lot. It means that we're gonna have people have access to the funds, for example, to be able to pay application fees. It is a universal representation that allows people to have due process regardless of their migrant status, especially where in the case of black migrants, we often are excluded from those types of opportunities for pro bono direct representation. What makes this fund special is that it's very inclusive. It leaves no one behind. And the program is going to be spearheaded by three major immigrant rights advocacy groups because they're the ones who know best what our neighbors need. Bueno, este es un momento tan importante y significativo para la comunidad porque es ayuda gratuita para nuestras familias y vamos a asegurar de que cientos de familias no sean separados y que reciban esta ayuda que es tan importante para poder seguir viviendo en sus comunidades y seguir contribuyendo en sus comunidades. Our goal, of course, is not to stop here, right? Our goal is to increase and deepen the work that we're doing in the district, yes, but hopefully to provide that model for the rest of the city about how you invest in the lives of black migrants, how you invest in the future of black migrants. 
20% of black people in this city and in this county are first or second generation black migrants. We're not going anywhere. And so there needs to be that deeper investment. We're proud to see this beginnings and we're hoping to see much more. Council District 13 recently partnered with the Los Angeles Police Department for a then etching event to help protect the vehicles of Angelinos. Held at Silver Lake Reservoir, vehicle identification numbers were carved onto catalytic converters in an effort to curb the theft of this expensive and valuable automobile part. We're here at the Reservoir for Silver Lake Boulevard partnering with LAPD and the community to etch VIN numbers onto catalytic converters. It uh, has been an issue in the area uh, that many Angelinos were, uh, have been concerned about. So we're happy to be out here to offer free VIN etching and hopefully to see that help mitigate the issue. Priuses are real popular. Believe it or not, any vehicles are, are subject to these kinds of thefts. It doesn't have to be a hiked up 4x4 or anything like that. Any car, these guys will slither underneath these cars and cut those catalytic converters right off. We recommend that Members of the public use a sonic sensor. It's something that you can add to your car alarm. It will pick up the vibrations and the sounds made from metal that's being cut. Otra cosa que estamos hablando aquí, estamos haciendo, estamos dando recomendación de que hay cosas que pueden poner abajo de estos conversores catalíticos como jaulas, por la razón de que estos con, uh, conversores catalíticos tienen mucho material uh, muy costosos. Lo que hacen es que llevan este, estos uh, catalíticos conversores, los llevan para áreas de reciclar y los venden y, por, y obtienen más o menos como 300 dólares por cada conversor catalítico. This is the first event for the Northeast Division, but we are looking forward to moving forward with it and having more of these events because even just being here today, we've heard a lot of support and constituents that were happy to see us out here doing this. So um, it's definitely something we're looking forward to scheduling more of these. The Los Angeles City Council has unanimously affirmed support for the proposed Chumash Heritage National Marine Sanctuary designation. The designation calls on the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration to adopt sanctuary regulations and prohibit new offshore oil and gas development. In addition, it calls for the sanctuary to be co-managed by the Chumash tribe and for the development of research programs that would address climate change. Contingent upon federal approval, this designation would be the first indigenous-led national marine sanctuary in U.S. history. To learn more or lend your support to protect the region's important marine ecosystem, visit sanctuaries.noaa.gov slash chumash heritage. Mayor Eric Garcetti has appointed Sergio Perez as the inaugural Inspector General for the Los Angeles Department of Water and Power. The position was created to bolster accountability and transparency following the launch of a federal investigation involving the LADWP billing system. Garcetti first announced the creation of an office of the Inspector General for LADWP in September 2019. As Inspector General, Perez will be part of the leadership team that will provide continuous reviews and oversight of contracting matters, whistleblower complaints, ethics, and other internal policies. Mr. Perez previously served as Executive Director for Orange County's Office of Independent Review and as the Director of Enforcement for the Los Angeles Ethics Commission. Mr. Perez will begin his term as LADWP Inspector General on May 9th. Mayor Eric Garcetti and Los Angeles City Council President Nuri Martinez recently announced the public reopening of City Hall and Council Chambers as of May 4th. Mayor Garcetti commented with, our decisions throughout the pandemic have been guided by the need to protect public health and to keep our residents and businesses safe. Proof of vaccination or negative COVID tests within the last 72 hours will be required to enter the building. Indoor masking will continue to be required. To determine if appointments are needed for in-person visits for a specific department, visit lacity.org or call 311. The organization City Plan spearheaded this year's city-led celebration of Arbor Day 2022. 
Families and volunteers from across South LA came out to plant trees in honor of this national holiday. Even Mayor Eric Garcetti and Council Member Marquise Harris Dawson rolled up their sleeves and dug into the task of planting over 200 trees in Council District 8. Take a look. Today is my favorite day of the year. We're at Arbor Day Los Angeles, the city of LA's tree planting celebration in honor of National Arbor Day. And we're gathered here with friends, families, neighbors, residents, and Angelinos to plant about 220 trees in the city in South Los Angeles today. Arbor Day to me is a day of climate and community action where trees are the focal point and we get to bring people together to really take, I think, climate change into their own hands. We're gonna plant 200 trees today in this neighborhood. Just yesterday in the city council, we put forward a motion to really take a hard look at our tree canopy. There's some places where it's great, there's some places where it's not so great. We want together uh, to make Los Angeles the best tree city in the world. We planted 64,000 trees just since the beginning of 2019. And we're planting them in neighborhoods that need them most. Like here in South LA, where less than 5% of the space in South LA has trees versus 25% of the city at large. So we wanna make sure a zip code doesn't define how healthy the air you breathe is, how much shade you have. And especially here where it's more densely populated, we need the trees even more. We're trying to improve our community, make it a safer place and just to live in so that future kids, my kids and um, his grandkids can like live in a safer place. LA City's Department of Aging and Council District 1 came together for a soft reopening of the Glassell Park Senior Center, which has been closed during the pandemic. The event highlighted the resources, services providers, and programs that will be available starting May 15. On behalf of Council District 1, we are very happy to have this soft opening of the LaSalle Park Senior Center. As you can see the sign behind me, Bienvenidos, which is welcome. Right now we have grab and go meals for them where they can have, pick up their meals and take them. We have services here where they can call in, where they're at transportation, case management, nutrition. Our goal is to have the center open by May 15th depending on COVID, but that is our goal, so that we can have the karaoke here, we can have the dancing, we can have the Domino's Club, and also for the other organizations that use this facility. Our main focus is to serve the older adult community and their caregivers. We partner up with uh, service providers that are in the community. We have uh, 18 multi-purpose senior centers, and so uh, the older adults uh, can go to these senior centers to get access to different programming and different services. We receive a call that they need transportation. They don't have to actually come to the center. They can just get the information by phone. The person in charge of that department will get in contact with them and they can schedule for pickup. The center is going to be open from 9 to 4, Monday to Friday. Council District 7 and the Department of Cultural Affairs recently unveiled a commission mural in the Northeast Valley. According to artist Erica Friend, the mural entitled A Valley in Time is a representation of the historic and agricultural past of Silmar. Murals are so important for the landscape of our city. The mural, A Valley in Time, is spectacular. It captures past and present, providing a true sense of homecoming and belonging for our community. I designed the project, the mural itself, and then there's a, another six artists that are helping me execute the mural onto the wall. Murals, as we see it, um, from the Department of Cultural Affairs, are a way of helping to establish community. Fine art murals build community identity and represent a signature feature of our urban fabric. It just encompasses all of the 
things that remind me of Somar or remind me of the San Fernando Valley or just overall the city of LA. We do projects that mainly focuses on creating cultural oases um, in places that usually aren't regarded as a cultural oasis. Being on this corner for 45 years and having to like stay on top of the graffiti, I, I just really had been cringing every day when I came in and saw it getting worse and worse and worse. And so to me it's a it's restored my hope and it's an emblem of transformation to the area. Yeah, we are a wonderful town. We got a lot of good feedback from the community. We got people honking, people stopping to say hello. All of you serve as an inspiration to the young women in our communities, allowing them to further see themselves as artists. For opportunities working on murals for the city, our department will put out different opportunities and different calls for artists uh, throughout the year. So stay tuned and that information can be found on our website at culturela.org. Uh, so I encourage you to check that out. It was an event filled with live music, free resources, and grocery giveaways. Council District 1, along with Central City Neighborhood Partners and other organizations, recently held the 2022 Pico Union Spring Festival. We'd like to welcome everyone to the 2022 Pico Union Spring Festival. In collaboration with Council District 1, El Centro del Pueblo, the Graph Lab, Pico Union Housing, and a whole another batch of organizations and groups that teamed up and partnered together to host this event for the community. Durante estos dos años en el Distrito 1, las comunidades como Pico Union han sido afectadas drásticamente y poder traer un evento así, la verdad que es muy hermoso porque hay bastantes familias que todavía necesitan recursos. We brought the Council District 1 mobile food truck, we brought diapers with El Centro del Pueblo, Baby to Baby donated some of the items as well. We have the Scholars Factory that is helping with some of those items. And we have free pupusas um, brought to all of us by La Pupusa Urban Eatery. Este evento se puso no nomás para traer alegría y armonía para la comunidad y los niños y los papás, pero también para ofrecerles recursos. El Distrito 1 uh, trajo su troca móvil de productos, no que se van a ir las familias con una bolsa muy llena de productos para su casa. All these families are leaving here fully loaded with a bag of produce, with a pupusa in their hand, with diapers and lots of essentials for their kids. As much as things seem to be returning to normal, the specter of COVID-19 continues to persist by means of newly discovered mutations and variants. In our feature story this week, Maria Holbrow sits down with Joanne O'Brien and Dr. Laura Kokinda from the LA Medical Services Division to discuss the changes in COVID transmissions and how to stay informed and healthy. Today I'm delighted to be joined by Dr. Laura Kokinda, psychologist, and Joanne O'Brien, Medical Services Administration from LA Emergency Management. You guys have just been such a solid source for great information for the last couple of years, and I'm delighted to have you both here today. Thanks for having us. Good to All be right. back. We keep hearing about these variants that are more transmissible, more transmissible, more transmissible. It's almost as each one has been, you know, Delta to Omicron to now this one is entitled what again? BA2. BA2. Um, what does that mean exactly? If I'm standing next to you and you happen to be infected, and when you exhale, it's kind of airborne, it's in the droplets of your saliva, and I breathe it in, it takes less of that virus to make you ill. So it just hooks on, and once it gets into your system, it can duplicate a whole lot faster. Okay, but with the vaccines, et cetera, the body's capacity to stop you from getting critically ill has been impacted in a good way. Absolutely, we know that to be true. If you're vaccinated, you're almost 100% not going to be in the hospital or get a, a really severe illness. Okay, all right. Dr. Kokenda, we've talked a lot about the mental things that have happened. What have you seen over the course of changing into this new, more open world? What kind of mental concerns should we be aware of? 
You know, it's very similar to what we were seeing before. It's just more change. Um, a lot of people, a lot of us finally got comfortable even with things we didn't like, you know, just being aware of the dangers, wearing our mask, doing those things. And now suddenly it's, people aren't wearing masks, you can go places. And as much as we've waited for that, it's, an, it's a, new, a new change and old habits die hard. What are some of the things that you should uh, be aware of that just add to the stress that we already have? Watching the news, of course, and be informed but limit it. Social media is another one. You want to be mindful of what you're taking in from your social media. A lot of people are gravitating to individuals who only think the way they do, which triggers a certain emotional response in us, and we're losing touch that people are people. We want to try to stay connected with everyone. And then the other thing is we really want to avoid drugs and alcohol. You can have maybe the glass happy hour, but we, we don't want to be using it for coping because that takes us down a, a very unhealthy path. Bad information propagates faster than right information. So what's the best source for the correct information? You know, can we trust the CDC? Can we trust, you yes, know, all of these you can. Okay. <laughs> yeah, you go, go to the CDC, your public health department. They've done, I think, a remarkable job of keeping data updated. Um, one of my favorite sites is John Hopkins University. They have tracked this data internationally from day one. It's just great. Okay. And you both are incredibly informative and thank you for your, your consistency and your great information that you've been providing through this, albeit, endless scenario of stressful times. So thank you both very, very much. Thank you. Thank you. Join the Center for the Arts Eagle Rock as they celebrate Earth Day. Earth Day Art Workshop is an event where participants gather to create sea creature sculptures from upcycled materials. Try out your creative chops using unwanted tin cans, plastic, glass, wood, paper, and more. The workshop is a free open activity that's fun for the whole family. Earth Day Art Workshop happens Friday, April 29th, beginning at 3 p.m. at Eagle Rock Plaza. For more information, visit cfaer.org. Are you ready to celebrate black creative works from the world over? If so, be sure to check out the Pan-African Film and Arts Festival. Now in its 30th year, the festival has returned to in-person exhibitions and they want to share their latest discoveries with you. Featuring more than 100 films, the festival brings stories from across the globe to a Los Angeles theater near you. You can also experience the culture of the African diaspora through the work of vendors and artisans on display at the Baldwin Hills Crenshaw Plaza. The Pan-African Film and Arts Festival is happening now through May 1st. For showtimes, tickets, and event schedules, visit paff.org. Calling all students aged 14 to 19, you're invited to participate in the latest meeting of Teens Leading Change. Now in cycle six, the group engages in neighborhood enrichment projects like community and park cleanups, eco-friendly garden projects, mural paintings, and more. You can even receive volunteer credit and community service hours. Teens Leading Change is a Los Angeles Public Library program in partnership with the Library Foundation of Los Angeles. Be a part of shaping the world you live in. The next Teens Leading Change meeting happens online Saturday, April 30th at 10 a.m. To get the link, visit lapl.org slash events. To keep up to date on teen programs at the LA Public Library, check out lapl.org slash teens. And that's a look at some things to do. And that's it for this edition. I'm Natalia Bilbao, and from all of us here at LA This Week, thank you so much for joining us. A reminder that you can catch us online at lacityview.org, and we're also on Facebook, Twitter, and YouTube. See you next time for more LA This Week. <laughs>